Oh boy, did the A's need that win. You are Locked On A's, your daily Oakland A's podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, A's fans, and welcome to Locked On A's, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. This is the daily podcast. We talk about your Oakland A's in their final season in Oakland all season long. I am your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. Please call me Sully. I've been a baseball podcaster for well over a decade now, and this is my sixth season here at the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm also the host of Locked On MLB, but I host both shows. So you get 10 episodes with your friend Sully here, provided you want to be with us here. We're available at Locked On A's on Twitter or whatever the hell it's called now. Also on Instagram, I'm your pal Sully. I'm at Sully Baseball on Twitter or what it, it's Twitter and Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram. And if you're listening every single day, then leave a hashtag that says Everyday A's. Gives us an idea of who's listening to us every single day. I'll tell you another thing. We'll tell you that today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on MLB. Use code all lowercase locked on MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Wow, the A's needed today. They really did. They really needed today to get the stink out of the last few days. Your pal Sully was at the Oakland Coliseum just a week ago, and I saw the A's win 20-4. to It was a fun day with a huge rain delay at the top, and they climbed back to 500. And since that game, the A's, from between that game and Saturday's game, the A's played six ball games. They lost five of them, and they gave up, on an average, more than nine runs a game. And that includes the game where the Rangers were being shut out into the eighth inning until Corey Seager hit that home run. They were starting to spin, and you started to think, at least I was, that, all right, the carriage is turning into a pumpkin. This is... What's happening here? They all right. They lost the final game to Florida or Miami. Um, all right, you won the series. They were winning up until the eighth inning. They got the gut punch with their Seager home run. They were blowing out of game two. They had the great game three win, but then they lost the game where they scored eleven runs, which just should never happen. And then they got their just the doors blown off the dump in game one against Seattle, and that was the one game I thought they had the edge. And I really started thinking, maybe it was a nice story for the first month and a half they were competitive. But we all thought this A's team was going to be not competitive. We thought this was going to be a 100-loss team. We all thought this was going to be a rough emotional year with the team about to leave the this Ownership making no attempt to try to feel the competitive ball club and probably to their benefit so they can keep pointing to empty stands. And I started thinking, could this be it? Could, was this just a fantasy for the first month and a half? And when Raleigh hit that home run in the second inning off of Estes today, I got to admit, my heart completely sank because I thought, here we go. It's just going to be more of this. But Here's the deal. Estes did well. Estes let up that home run, and he only let up one other hit. He only let up one other hit. He didn't hit a batter. He didn't walk a batter. But he hit the, the home run and say two for five innings. And we would have all asked a genie for that start from Estes. Now, the Mariners were, start, were starting Miller. Miller's a good pitcher this year. The Mariners have very good pitching this year. And we saw in that, that second inning rally um, where, you know, Toro gets the gets the big, uh, the big RBI single. Rooker gets another big hit. And then there you go, two to one. And then 
precarious. Those next bunch of innings felt like, I don't know if you ever saw that documentary Man Man on a Wire about the dude who did the high wire walk between the two World Trade Center towers, the twin towers there. I don't know if you ever saw that. It's it's it, it's uh, anxiety inducing. Well, that's what the next bunch of innings were with Spence. Okay, Adams. Okay, you know they every time they got a, you know the a base runner got to a three count, you know a three ball count. I was thinking, oh dear lord, oh dear lord. And remember, if you just looked at the score, oh. A's eight to one. Okay, good. The A's blew the doors off the dump. There you go. They needed a good, relaxing blowout win. It was not a relaxing blowout win. It was two to one going into the eighth. And you knew that while the Mariners are not exactly the 1989 A's with the Bash Brothers and Ricky Henderson, Rojas can hit. Yo, know, Rodriguez can hit. Hanniger is off to a rough start, but you know he's capable of hitting. We already saw the rally hit a home run. You know that Polanco's not off to a good start, but you know he's a major league hitter. Hit all these guys who you know are just any minute now they're going to explode. Any minute now, you know, and and all it just takes one swing of the bat. One, sw- excuse me, as I scratch my nose at the top of my head, looks like I'm giving signs to steal. And they, you know, they the A's pushed ahead. That the one lone run in the eighth inning, and then an inter- two interesting things happened. First of all, um, you saw the you know Rooker got the base hit, and so you know and uh, got a base hit. You know, there was you had uh, Ruiz uh, at third, and then Rooker stole second. That was a huge play in the game. I know it didn't feel it, it may not it may not feel that way, but Rooker's stolen base completely changed the complexion of that inning. Because any hope for Seattle to get an inning ending double play right there was scrapped. And by the way, uh many years ago I made a video about uh, on my old Sully baseball label about how I believe we need to do away with uh, catch, uh, uh, was it, uh, indifference fielders, uh, fielders, indifference, defensive indifference, a stolen base is a stolen base, whether they care or not, you know, a conceded run is still a run. You know, there are a, a sacrifice is still an out. It may not be in that bat, but if you steal a base, whether they throw through or not, that's still a stolen base because that could change the complexion of an inning. If you take away the force out at second base, you can start a rally there. Even if you're down 8 nothing, if you steal that base, that could be the beginning of something. In fact, later today, we're going to talk about a, a, a player who's involved in a huge Oakland uh, comeback victory. But with Rooker stealing the base, suddenly the infield was in. The whole strategy for the inning was changed. Now, they did get the strikeout, but there was now a – base open and Langoliers was walked. The this is something that would not have happened if it was first and sec or first and third. So Langoliers was walked, bringing up Max Schumann. And Schumann's not been playing well. But a low and also behold, with the bases loaded, he hit that double down the left field line that scored all three runs. Langoliers, you know, doing his best Ken Griffey Jr. in the playoffs impersonation, scoring all the way from first. And suddenly, a a, a three-to-one game, uh, sorry, a two-to-one game was now a five-to-one game. And then, of course, the uh, in the ninth inning, the wild pitch scored Harris. Blade home run to hit the home run to score Toro and, and basically put the game out, out of reach to the point where they didn't need to use Miller. I actually wouldn't mind if they use Miller because I get a little wary when relievers get rusty. But either way, either way, Urseg did the job. Kelly uh, got one, two, three, struck him out at the end and in front of 32,000 in a, in a pretty quick game. For an 8-1 to one game, it was under two and a half hours. 
Viva pace of play. Uh, they needed that. The A's needed a win. It was many things. It was a well-pitched game. It was a well-played game. The A's defense was very, very good. Uh, Harris made a couple of excellent plays at third base. The bullpen did their job, and they blew open the game when they needed to blow it open. And the, I guess, the linchpin that turned it from a two-to-one high wire act to an eight-to-one laugher in so many ways was that stolen base by Rooker. It may not feel that way. It may have you say, oh, the double this and all that. And yes, all those were critical. But what set it up was quite simply the fact that the stolen base changed the complexion of the inning. Remember, the A's have not lost a rubber game this entire season. Will it continue? Hey, let's hear a little bit from our friends at Policy Genius. Policy Genius is the nation's leading online marketplace for life insurance. It saves you time and money so you can provide your family with a financial safety net starting today. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 a year for $1 million of coverage. Some offer. Some options offer same-day approval and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Life can be unpredictable, and Policy Genius can take away some of the worries of what your family would do if something happened. Policy Genius gives you unbiased advice from a licensed expert support team. They have no incentive to recommend one insurer over another, so you can trust their guidance. Thousands of five-star reviews on Google and Trustpilot from customers who found their best fit for their needs with Policy Genius. Check life insurance off your to-do list in no time with Policy Genius. Head to policygenius.com slash locked on MLB or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quote and see how much you can save. That's policygenius.com slash locked on MLB. Hey, where do you go for the best analysis, news, and for the greatest takes on all in all your favorite sports stories, I would recommend checking out Locked On Sports Today. Locked On Sports Today is the first ever national sports streaming service dedicated completely to sports. It's a free 24-7 streaming channel program for you every day to bring you the biggest stories in sports with the Locked On community. It brings you can't miss analysis, opinions, and news, streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channel app, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it is your team every day. Hey, let's take a quick peek at what people have been saying. We've got a lot of terrific comments from a lot of you who are my everyday A's listeners and a couple of people who are fan- came over here from Locked On MLB. Uh, I did a whole episode on my basically my disdain for the idea of using public money and i stand by that public money for building stadiums using taxpayer money to build a palace and i have no problems with people using private money but once you start tapping into the uh, to public money then guess what you can no longer claim this is just a business you got to keep your hands off there, there's no sharing of the profits. There's no sharing of the revenues that come about with it. So why should we be paying for that? And what always happens is the nonsense of which has been disproven over and over again that it creates an economic boom, horse manure. Now, uh, Stephen. Colaterra 3257 says, you're right, Sully. Yankee Stadium has been in the South Bronx for 100 years. Where's the economic boom? There is right around there for the restaurants and everything, but you go one block away from Yankee Stadium. Um, nope, nope, not not true. Um, the real problem, uh, this is uh, this is still Stephen uh, uh, Colaterra 3257. Uh, the real problem is that cities and their citizens don't own the teams. At the very least, any public money for a stadium should give equity ownership shares in the team with a percentage of the profits going to the city for public needs. Yeah, exactly. And if you use private money, if it's privately funded, 
then it's your business. But if you're taking taxpayer money, then it's no longer a private enterprise. Okay? Uh, JJ uh, WS5US probably means something. I don't know. Ask the Marlins about their stadium and how it brought an economic boom by using public funds. The Marlins make the A's look like on the up and up. If you read about what happened with the building of that stadium and just the, it was just, they should be making a 10 part Netflix series about the making of that. Um, there's a, now David Mack seemed to take a, 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 a different approach to me. He says, you know, sports provide an escape for the BS going on in the world today. The people of Oakland miss the Raiders. The people of San Diego miss the Chargers. The people of Montreal miss the Expos, et cetera. Filling potholes is a good thing, but it doesn't really add to your quality of life. Well, it adds to the quality of life if you're driving. But I, I completely agree, David Mack, that having a team – that that could be a unifying spot, could be a rallying point for a city. Obviously, the fans of San Diego miss the Chargers. Obviously, you know, I got my Expos pennant up there. When I lived in New York in the 90s, you could still feel the ripple effects of the loss of the Dodgers in Brooklyn still happening. And that's true. I mean, look, you don't have to explain to me about the joy of a sports team. I've been a baseball podcaster for over a decade, and trust me, the first, I don't know, six years I did it, I made exactly, you see this penny? That is a penny more than I earned the first four or five years I did baseball podcasting. I understand that it's a respite. I understand that it is, I don't want to even say distraction. It, it, it's a, it's, it is an escape. It is something that could provide a great sense of a you know, rallying cry for a city. I've been doing a lot of research on my the book that I'm writing about the 72 postseason. The Detroit Tigers, who lost to the A's in the ALCS that year, that Tigers team was a great rallying point for a beleaguered city, dating back also to the World Series in 1968. We all know what happened in New York post 9-11. We all know what happened in Boston post uh, the marathon bombing. We understand that it could be a great rallying point and an escape and a respite. But it remains a respite. It remains entertainment when it boils down to it. And public money should be spent for things for the public. It's not a hard concept to understand. And if public money is being used for a stadium, then guess what? Using the BS of, well, you you all make a lot of money once we have the stadium here. No, 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 no. It has to be something more concrete, like the concrete. So I I, I understand what you're say, saying, David Mack, but it doesn't change what I'm saying. That public money should be going to public to public projects. And I'm not just saying this because I'm a public school teacher. There are things that we need to spend money on to make a city run. And that money, that green, shouldn't be going to a billionaire who says, build me a palace or I go. No, build it yourself. Build it yourself if it's such a great investment. And again, if the, uh, there are people with a lot of money in the Bay Area. They could have raised the money to build it in Jack London Square or at Howard Terminal. They could have worked out an issue or, or a solution to maybe build it in Fremont, build it in San Jose, or as I've been saying, build it in the freaking parking lot of the Oakland Coliseum. Just build it there. There's space. You're going to knock down the Coliseum anyway. Have it, have it be there. There's plenty of parking. We already know where it is. You're not displacing a community or knocking down a bunch of buildings to do it. That's private money time. Don't take away from things that we need to run a city. Can you imagine if your house was falling apart, the roof was caving in, or you got termites, or the sewage was starting to back up, or, or the, the, the septic tank explodes in your front lawn? And you start talking about how, but look at the, the, the huge TV I just bought. Huh? I just bought a Lamborghini. No, 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 no. You need to spend the money on the things that.
to make the city run. And if you're not going to do that, you want cities to pay for it, they should come with strings. Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. It's the easiest and most exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You can pick more than or less than on two or more player stats and watch the winnings roll in. Don't miss your chance to add your favorite players from the diamond in your prize picks entry, whether it's strikeouts, RBIs, or first inning runs. Take your picks on more than or less than, and then add them to your prize picks entry today. Get in on the playoff action and win up to 100 times your money on prize picks as you and the world's best players take the game to a new level during basketball's postseason. Prize picks is really simple to play. I can make my picks and submit them in less than 60 seconds. Download the app and use the code LOCKEDONMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Yes, download the app today and use the code LOCKEDONMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize fix. Pick more. Pick less. It's that easy. Hey, what's your go-to spot for checking out the latest in sports, opinions, takes, and the news? Have it be Locked On Sports Today, the first ever national 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. It's now available on the free Amazon Fire TV's channel app. Check it out for all the latest from the Locked On experts and the national shows. Check it out, Locked On Sports Today. Have that be your hub. Now the shortstop. All right, we're going to do the latest episode of I Bet You Forgot They Were On The A's. Pretty soon, Matt Holliday will be best known as being Jackson's dad, as Jackson Holliday has made a cameo in the Major Leagues. Did seem 100% ready, but he will indeed become a star. I think everyone could see that he is going to become a star for the Baltimore Orioles. And the Orioles have the luxury of being a very good team. So they say, ah, he's not 100% ready. Let him cook a little more. Unless we forget, Matt Holliday himself was quite a player. He ha- he had a wonderful, wonderful career. When you look back, and some people believe a borderline Hall of Fame career. He was a seven-time All-Star, four-time Silver Slugger, and was the most valuable player of the National League Championship Series when the Colorado Rockies won their first and only pennant. The Oklahoma native, much like Mickey Mantle, was a huge star for the Colorado Rockies and was a big part of their pennant push and the magical Rocktober that they had when they went from well, a fringe wildcard contender to the World Series. Now, while he was the NLCS MVP, he had his first postseason GOAT moment when the Rockies Yes, the Rockies had the doors blown off, blown off their cars in game one against the Red Sox in the World Series that year. But the Rockies actually took a lead at one point in game two and were playing the Red Sox very tight and had a holiday on base in the eighth inning as the tying run. And the Red Sox had to bring in their closer, Papelbon, in the eighth inning. And so how did he get out of the rally? He picked holiday off. He picked them off to end the eighth inning and end any rally. And with that, the air went out of the balloon for the Rockies, who were desperately trying to steal a game at Fenway Park. The Rockies went on to lose games three and four and got swept in what is considered to be one of the most lopsided and uncompetitive World Series in baseball history. If they had rallied in game two, it would not have made that list. However, Holiday remained a popular player in Colorado, but couldn't get a big contact contract extension. And it looked like he was going to ski daddle after the 2009 season. And so what happened? The A's made a very rare move to bring in a big veteran, albeit one who was about to go to free agency. Billy Bean pulled the trigger. Gone were Zito, gone was Hudson, gone was Mulder. And the team that went to the ALCS in 2006 was uncompetitive in 2007 and 2009. So in a weird, strange, you know, uh, off season between 08 and 09, Bean pushed the chips to the center of the table, hoping to win the West. 
he brought in some veterans. Jason Jambi returned. Nomar Garcia Parra showed up. And they traded for Matt Holiday. They were hoping to get catch lightning in the bottle with those three veterans to maybe put up some big numbers and maybe, just maybe, squeeze out another division title while they looked at a starting rotation that had the likes of Trevor Cahill and Dallas Braden, Gio Gonzalez, and Brett Anderson, a couple other decent young pitchers, plus Andrew Bailey was closing some games out. Maybe there was hope for the A's. The answer was there wasn't. The A's did not play very well, and when it came down to stretch time, it looked like Matt Holliday, who kind of was looking around the Coliseum going like, yeah, I'm not going to stay here. I'm not going to stay. I played in the Homer Happy Coors Field, and I'm now playing here. Now, he did have a big, big moment with the A's on July 20th. The A's had a 10-run comeback, and Matt Holliday homered twice and drove in six, got a seventh inning grand slam that tied the game. And the the A's had that one big frenzy moment, but it was clear he didn't belong. And the A's wind up shipping him off to St. Louis just before the trade deadline in 2009, where they brought in a prospect named Brett Wallace. And Brett Wallace was a first round pick who bounced around like crazy in the minor leagues. He was drafted he was, I forget which team even drafted him. I, I know that he was traded to the A's and the, I think it was the Cardinals and the Blue Jays before he finally made his big league debut with the Houston Astros. Meanwhile, Matt Holiday found himself in another playoff push. Ironically, the Rockies made the postseason without him, partly because Carlos Gonzalez was a big hitter for that year's uh, Colorado Rockies squad. Where did the Rockies get him? He was one of the minor league prospects that the A's shipped off to pick up Holiday. Virtually none of the players that the A's got for Holiday when they traded him to St. Louis panned out. In the postseason that year, Matt Holiday got a big home run off of Clayton Kershaw in a game against the Dodgers. But with two outs of the ninth inning of game two, James Loney of the Dodgers hit a fly ball to Matt Holiday. And the ball clanked off his glove. What would have been the final out of the game prolonged a rally, and the Dodgers came from behind to win that and later swept the series from St. Louis. Once again, Matt Holiday had the goat horns for the postseason. Eventually, he would win his ring with the St. Louis Cardinals in 2011 and would finish his career up going back to the Colorado Rockies after a quick cameo with the New York Yankees. He's now going to be remembered as the dad of, of, of an inevitable all-star career for Jackson Holiday. But briefly, oh so briefly, he was a member of the Oakland A's. Well, it's Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. And uh, maybe the A's can have another Dallas Braden-like Mother's Day and see what we could do. And if they can win today, then the A's will once again win a rubber match and, well, salvaged some of the bad feelings that came about from dropping three out of four to Texas and dropping the first one to Seattle. Follow us at Locked On A's on Twitter, whatever it's called now, and on Instagram. I'm your pal Sully. I'm at Sully Baseball on Twitter, Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram. Celebrating an A's win that was a lot harder than it looked. This is Locked On A's. I am your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. Please call me Sully.